Father Tony Flannery, thank you so much for joining us on Common Home TV. You're welcome. Good to be with you. Um, I guess my first question would be about the Irish Synodal Pathway. When I was doing some research on this, the first thing I noticed that on the website, they mention the shocking revelations as one of the issues that was meant to be addressed. What are these shocking revelations? And also, what does it say about our church that we can't still speak freely about these injustices by name in 2023? <laughs> That's an interesting way of putting it, Matthew. I, I presume the shocking revelations would be to do with the revelations of clerical sexual abuse, and that was a big, big issue in Ireland over the last 30 years or more. It has dominated the whole dialogue around church and uh, faith and all of that. So it also, of course, contributed massively to the decline in the credibility of the church and to the power of power and influence of the institution. So that uh, one of the positive aspects of it all uh, was, I mean, in itself, it was a horrible thing and it was a horrible time to live through all of that. Uh, but one of the positive aspects of it, I think, is that it actually provoked the church authorities in Ireland to face up to a lot of realities that they had never faced up to before. And as such, they became open to the possibility of a synodal process. Uh, I was one of the founders of the Association of Catholic Priests uh, in 2010. And ever since our foundation, we have been pushing hard for some form of synodal process, or some form of, of openness to giving voice to the people. But for years, the bishops ignored us, wouldn't talk to us, wouldn't engage in any way. But eventually, it got through to them that the whole thing was falling apart, that there wasn't a future for the church as they envisioned it, and that but some form of road to Damascus conversion for the Irish bishops. And personally, I'm amazed at what has happened in the last few years in the sense of making progress towards a new style of church. The other thing that was mentioned um, was the need to honor the contribution of women. That was one of the things that the, the website uh, brought up. Do you believe that the issue lies in us not honoring the role of women in the church? Or does it lie in the lack of opportunity and authority for women in the church? Oh, absolutely. It, it, like the first part of that sentence, honoring the uh, women in the church, that's just talk, really. That, that annoys me because it's the sort of soft language that has been used for so long. It has to do with real hard realities, uh, giving women a real say in decision-making, and in active ministry. And gradually now in Ireland, the bishops are recognizing that, that women have to be given a full equal place in the church. It won't happen overnight, Matthew. I don't expect it to happen to any great extent in my lifetime. I'm 75 years of age now, but it's coming. There's no doubt about it. And there has been a really significant change in church authorities in Ireland towards that issue. Well, just speaking about the word authority, you've had your, you know, we'll speak a little bit later about this, but where should authority be derived from in, in a religious institution, in a faith, in, in, in faith? What, what, what should give somebody authority in the community? Where do you see that? Well, that, that is... Yeah, yeah, Matthew, and that is one of the big theological questions. Uh, but in, uh, Because traditionally in the church, when I say traditionally, I don't mean from the very beginning, but certainly for the last millennium or so, authority rested with ordination. 
that unless you were ordained into the clerical state, you had no say over anything uh, in, as regards decision-making or ministry in any form. Um, increasingly in theological circles and more and more in the discussion that's going on, it's being recognised that the source of authority is baptism. That, in other words, authority is equally shared between all members of the believing community, all baptised members of the church. Now, that is a dramatic change in thinking. And the implications of that, oh, I'd say it will take a long time to work through, but they will be enormous. And I'd be very hopeful of that. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, you know, we speak about this synodal pathway and the, um, the need to address transparency, because transparency throughout the church um, would be a way to curb a lot of issues that, that arise. Thus far, uh, how do you see transparency being played out in the th- synodal pathway? Surprising, now again, I, I, I'm talking with you here about how the Irish experience. I've read a good bit about international experience, but other people will speak to you better about that. I'm talking about the Irish experience. I am pleasantly surprised to the extent of being amazed at the degree to which transparency is working in the process in Ireland. Um, about sometime in the month of June, you see the process has been going on in Ireland as it has been around the world. And there have been all sorts of meetings at parish level, diocesan level, among various interested groups. And then all the submissions were sent in. And then in June, there was a meeting uh, with selected representatives from each place or each group that sent in the submission. And the synthesis of all the submissions was presented. Now, I was at that meeting representing the Association of Catholic Priests, and uh, I was very pleasantly surprised to hear the all the issues that have been brought up and that I knew were in submissions from here, there, and everywhere, that they were all presented very straightforward, almost very boldly from the platform that day. And in that gathering of there were about 60 or 70 people at it, I think practically all the Irish bishops were present. And from my point of view, and I know we'll refer to this later, a lot of the stuff that I was uh, suspended for saying 10 years ago were now being said officially from the platform. And of course, our big fear then was that, okay, this has all come in now, this synthesis has been drawn up, but in the end, the bishops are going to have the final say in the document that will be presented to Rome. But at the end of the meeting that day, Bishop Eamon, Archbishop Eamon Martin, who's the head of the Irish Church, quite a traditional, he's from the north of Ireland, he's a dairy man, he's a good man, but he'd be uh, quite traditional. But he stood up at the end of the meeting and he guaranteed us that there would be no effort to change or water down any of the contents that was presented today, that day in, at that meeting. Now, I was amazed to hear him saying that because I really expected there would be a load of watering down done. But when eventually the final document, the one that went to Rome, was produced, it was published. Now, that's that's very new for the Irish Church. And it was very faithful to what we had heard at the meeting. So a whole new level of transparency that I've never experienced before in the Irish Church has broken out. And that, you know, <laughs> is this the Holy Spirit or whatever it is? But it's great to see it. Oh, that sounds great. Um, in the next phase, just to clarify, so the, the document's been sent to Rome. So how, how does the Irish Church, um, how, how, how 
do the next steps look? Um, when Rome receives reeds, how will that be implemented throughout uh, parishes? Well, that's the big question, of course, Matthew. And uh, it, we would appear now, uh, independently of the international process, that Francis is, is uh, overseeing and that he has added the next year to now. The Irish process is aimed to go on until 2025. And now that we have gone through the first stage of it, we have our document. Not only was it sent to Rome, but it also has now been recognised as the statement of where the Irish church is at. So the next stage is implementation. And of course, that's the really difficult stage. And I just don't know how that will work. Uh, mm. There have been, over the last number of years, uh, efforts by various dioceses to do uh, some form of listening exercise. One diocese, the Diocese of Limerick, even called it a synod at the time they were doing it. But I'd say about half a dozen dioceses have done various types of listening exercises. <clears throat> Very interesting exercises, but by and large, they ended up with documents gathering dust in shelves. And that's the worry. Will the same thing happen this time? Now, there's more momentum behind it at this stage. But it's going to be very difficult. For one thing, um, if this was done 30 years ago, mm. it would have had a much better chance. Mm. The church in Ireland now is in quite a sorry state, really. Uh, church attendance has gone way down. And by and large, in any given church in Ireland, you'll hardly see anybody under the age of 50 uh, and maybe even under the age of 60. So mm. that the Catholic, the, the church attending people in Ireland are old and to a fair degree they're tired. Mm. And a lot of them have been through all this before and it will be hard to convince them that this is something new. And the second big reality is the state of the clergy. Uh, vocations have dried up almost totally. Uh, we did a survey in the Association of Catholic Priests uh, recently about uh, the age factor of Irish priests. And really, you know, the, with the way things are going, priesthood, native priesthood in Ireland will be largely non-existent in about 15 years. And uh, now, like you mentioned about Australia, um, here in Ireland too, some bishops are importing priests from out from, from third world countries mostly. And it's, uh, it's, it's more an effort <clears throat> to try to preserve the old system mm. rather than bring about anything new. So I don't see a future in that. Some of the places where they have attempted to implement new ways of doing things at parish level and at diocesan level, in other words, by giving a, a real say, a real voice to the people, one of the biggest blocks to the, anything happening was actually the clergy partly because they're old and tired, and this would involve a new way of doing things, and it's hard to, as they say, teach the old dog new tricks. But also, and this is human nature, people who have exercised authority all their lives don't want to let go of it. And in order to give a voice to the people, the priest and the bishop, have to let go of a fair degree of the way in which they exercise leadership and authority up to now. That will be very, very difficult and it will be a real struggle. So there's a long battle ahead of us, but as I say, we've come farther than I would have expected us to at this stage. You were suspended from public ministry by the Vatican 
in 2012 for publicly expressing support of women's ordination and same-sex marriage, as well as views on homosexuality. All these themes are now being openly discussed by synodal gatherings around the world. It seems the church is really in a synodal mode of listening and reconciliation. Why then do you believe the last offering from the Vatican to return you to mission included demands you promised to remain silent on these issues and sign statements um, affirming church teaching? <laughs> You're correct in, in your description of what happened. Why it happened, <laughs> I don't know, uh, Matthew. Uh, it, it's a very, <clears throat> it was 2010, actually. It's 12 years now since I was, oh, sorry, no, you're right, 2012. Um, well, I, I just, I, sorry to cut you off, but did you expect the dicastery of the doctrine of faith? Or does nobody expect the dicastery of the doctrine of faith? Of course I didn't. No, it came out totally out of the blue. Got a phone call from my superior general in Rome saying, I want you here tomorrow. And don't tell anybody. The secrecy thing was so weird about it all, Matthew. <clears throat> of course, uh, <clears throat> I ignored it uh, to the extent that I even uh, published a book containing all the documentation and everything. And I'd said that's part of the reason that they don't like me over there. But uh, it was a very, very strange experience. Um, for me now to see everything that I argued for, and not just me, but lots of others were arguing for the same things. It was very much part of the mission of the Association of Catholic Priests. But to see it all being um, openly discussed now, it, it's strange. And uh, why I haven't been restored to ministry, I don't know. I don't know. At the age that I met Matthew, I'm not that uh, excited about going back into ministry anyway. And I suppose my views have changed dramatically over the past 10 years. Uh, the whole notion of priesthood, as we've had it, um, doesn't really appeal to me anymore. Uh, this uh, thing of the special position of the priest, you know, the, the phrase they use, that when you're ordained, you're ontologically changed. I mean, that is awful nonsense, really, I think. So um, what I would like, and I never get it, I know, but it's what I keep arguing for. What I would like is that a proper, fair and just procedure be set up to deal with my case. That's what I'd love. And whatever the result of that would be, I'd be quite content. My difficulty with the whole process was that it was all done in secret, that I was never allowed to know my accusers. I was never allowed to... Uh, uh, speak face to face with the people who were condemning me, in other words, the Vatican authorities, and there was no court of appeal. The system, at the time I consulted some civil lawyers here in Ireland because I was considering taking a case against the church, which in the end I didn't do. But when I described to them the process that was used in my case by the Vatican authorities, they were absolutely amazed. They said, this is, in civil law, this wouldn't be happening even in the 16th century, not to mind now. So, like, I suppose I'm fighting a bit of a futile battle at this stage because every time this issue comes up and when I meet this bishop tomorrow, that's what I'll be saying to him. I want a fair process, not just for me, but like over the last 10 years, Matthew, I've met a lot of priests and lay people and sisters because I've traveled a good bit with the International Church Reform Movement who have been treated in exactly the same way as me. And unless the church finds a fair and just arbitration process for dealing with cases like mine, they're going nowhere. But 
I don't think I, I get what I'm looking for. I, I think I think many will hear you being critical of the Vatican. Um, and there's an association there because it's a major symbol and instrument of our shared faith, right? So I, th I think that sometimes there can be a confusion between uh, the Vatican or Vatican procedure and that of the, the Catholic faith. So what do you see as uh, hope in the Catholic Church, not within necessarily structurally what's happening with um, uh, the Vatican and how it relates, but on the ground, what what have you seen in the past 10 years of being outside of ministry that gives you hope? Mainly Pope Francis. Uh, I, I, I think Pope Francis has been an extraordinary blessing for the church. And uh, I'd be like, he's not perfect and he makes mistakes and all that. And, and that's fair enough. We all do that. But by and large, he has brought a whole new energy into the church. And uh, I think the whole synodal process is an example of it. So that's where my hope is. And I just hope he lives a few more years mm -hmm. to yeah. embed what he's trying to do. Uh, or alternatively, that somebody of like mind succeeds him, but there's no guarantee of that with the type of stuff that's going on in the church at the moment, particularly in the American church. But just very, very quickly to, you see, in my case, what was interesting was the, the head of the CDF that I dealt with in an early stage was Gerhard Müller. And Francis fairly soon after he became Pope moved Mueller off the job and uh, replaced him by a Jesuit uh, who hasn't been great either, I must say. But anyway, the second uh, diktat that I got from the Vatican with the document to sign, which was about four years ago, was signed by a guy called Giacomo Morandi. And again, by coincidence, <clears throat> about six months later, Francis sacked him from his job. So I can see the way in which Francis is trying to change the, even the way the, the castry for the doctrine of the faith operates. And, and all of that is hopeful. Um, but has it all come too late? Uh, the clerical church, it would appear, is going to collapse. Um, well, whole... speaking in, in the West, especially, because, I mean, contextually through, like, Africa and Asia, that's still a model that, that has um, resonance culturally. But will that last mm. um, as, a, as developing countries become more developed and more educated, they tend to follow, like say Poland now, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, a, a lot of the patterns that have happened in Western Europe are now happening in Poland. Vocations are declining, people are losing faith in the institution, all that sort of thing. <clears throat> a new way of doing ministry in the church has to develop. And uh, we will have to go back to the early system of the believing community having a say in who is their minister. And the notion of different types of ministry, all working in equality. Now, am I living in dream world talking about that? But I think what we're experiencing now is the beginnings of a really radical change in church. And if one were to be alive in a hundred years time, I think the type of way in which the gospel will be presented and promoted will be very, very different to what we have now. And I would be inclined to say that, that the collapse in vocations, 
the resistance of the official church to open up new ways of ministry, all of that, that that is actually part of the way that the Spirit is bringing about change in the church. Mm. I hope so. Um, my fa- final question, because you've been very generous with your time. Um, what is one thing or a few things that your detractors, um, I've been online, and not a great place to have detractors, is it? Twitter.com. <laughs> but what do you think your detractors get wrong about your case or about your theology? Matthew, I don't engage with detractors in social media at all. Are they saying all these nasty things about me? <laughs> but in general, the, the, the people, those, those who uh, feel that, that your, your, uh, your actions so far have been so far in line with church teaching or uh, feel you as heretical, um, what do you think they're getting wrong about their arguments against what you've put forward? That's a difficult one, Matthias, because in a sense, I can see that from their point of view, they're not getting wrong at all, because I think it, it, it comes down to a fundamental thing in that, is the church unchanging? Uh, is God the same yesterday, today, and forever? In other words, is everything that was declared at the beginning unchangeable and unquestioning? Uh, and, and a lot of people believe that very, very firmly and have built their whole uh, m- meaning of their lives around it. And then mm-hmm. along comes somebody like me and says, and, and I mean, <laughs> now there's not just me, there's loads of uh, theologians and all that thing, that no, actually things do change. Uh, each generation has to read the signs of the times and has to uh, respond accordingly. That is very threatening for people who are clinging to a traditional faith. And I'd have, I'd have a fair bit of sympathy for them. Um, and we see it here in Ireland, and I think in, in my experience in America also, and England, and that a lot of the younger priests would be hanging on to this very traditional faith. And uh, they would be delighted that people like me are in our 70s and we'd soon be dead and gone. And they'll have it to themselves, they think. Um, Life is tough, I suppose, in a lot of ways for everybody. And there is a certain security in clinging to uh, convictions that you find meaning and a a fear in letting them go. I want to thank you for your time. And, um, you know, there's much more we can speak about, so hopefully we can do this again at some point. Lovely talking to you, Matthew, and best of luck to you. And uh, if any of my friends in Australia see this, I'll say hello to them. Okay, thank you very much.